Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our last webinar of 2019. My name is Maggie Howell and I'm the Executive Director uh, here at the Wolf Conservation Center. So a few things before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, you'll see a Q&A box in your control panel. So just please type your questions in there and we'll provide time for questions at the end of the presentation. Also, a recorded version of the webinar will be available within a day or so uh, on the Wolf Conservation Center website. So today we're joined by Geraldine uh, Werhan, who has generously offered to discuss the Himalayan wolf, uh, the evolutionarily unique canid adapted to life on the world's tallest mountain range. Uh, Geraldine Weihan is a canid conservation scientist with a special focus on the Himalayan wolf of the Asian high altitudes. She received her master's in science of biology in 2011 from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland and recently completed her doctorate with the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit at the University of Oxford, uh, UK, with her research around the phylo phylogeny and ecology of the Himalayan wolf. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Geraldine. Welcome, Geraldine. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Maggie and the Wolf Conservation Center. I'm really pleased to speak to you all about the Himalayan wolf, specifically its ecology, the genetics and conservation. I've just completed my doctorate thesis researching exactly these components around this wolf. So in this presentation, I'm going to give you a brief overview in the introduction and then dive right into the research that I did. I did ecological research, especially into the Himalayan wolf's diet. And then the, sec the third part is about phylogenetics. And phylogenetics is just describing genetics work, genetics analysis that tries to understand the evolutionary history of a species of a lineage. And then in the end, I will talk about what we have learned for conservation from all this research so far. So let's dive right into the introduction. So the Himalayan wolf is this wolf lineage that is found in the high altitudes of Asia, specifically the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. So these high altitudes, they were formed when the continents collided. So when the Indian subcontinent crashed into the Eurasian continent and basically the continental plate started to fold up and you got this rise in altitude very high up and the ecosystems changed a lot during that process. Um, but this wolf has been overlooked by science and conservation until recently. Only in the last 20 years, we started to get some um, research around them and learn that they might be different and not just a gray wolf. But currently they still suffer because everyone in the world has been thinking it's just a gray wolf and nobody did much of research up there. Um, but they were first noted by early explorers that thought that they looked different. So these early explorers were um, people like Hodgins, Smith and Gray, but they actually mostly worked based on pelts or skulls that somebody brought back to them. They were naturalists and they just saw a pelt, saw a wolf and maybe thought, okay, this looks different than this European wolves that we're used to. So they, they first made some notes, but that was not so profound. The Himalayan wolf is also called Tibetan wolf, so it's a synonym. You will find both of these names in the literature that has been confusing in the past. Um, but now we know this is a very unique wolf of the Asian high altitudes and it's only found there. From the pictures that you see, you can see this wolf can come in a sandy color to the lower left. Um, and that's actually how it really blends into the landscape. You can see it's basically the same color as the surrounding um, vegetation, which is very dry and harsh up there. But there's also black individuals. As you find in gray wolves, there's some black individuals and that's usually some dog genes that have come into the wolf genetic pool. And to the, to the right, you have a very, we have a very white specimen, very beautiful one. But wolves and dogs, have always had some, you know, sharing of genetics. So that's a very natural ongoing thing. 
So specifically, these wolves, in the beginning, they were thought to just occur in the Himalayas, therefore the name Himalayan wolf. But throughout my research, we could clarify that they actually are also found across the Tibetan plateau. So before I just dug up all the research and put it together, people thought, oh, there's a wolf in the Himalayas, there's a wolf, a different wolf on the Tibetan plateau. It was all very confusing. By taking all the genetic samples together, we could actually um, realize and verify that it's the same high altitude wolf and whatever we want to call it. And it makes a lot of sense for anybody who's ever been in the Himalayas. It's this very high mountain chain and then it continues right on to the Tibetan plateau, which is this very high altitude area and it's more rolling. But the prey community is the same, the prey species that roam around and also the, the conditions, the temperatures are the same. So for now, we know that the Himalayan wolf is found in Nepal, where I did most of my research. There's also, um, we know it's found in India, in China, and then Bhutan is very likely that they're found there, but nobody has verified that to date. Hopefully I'll get to that in the future. And we expect that, or we could expect that they are found in the Himalayas and the mountains of Pakistan, but that's also not yet um, verified. So just to give you an overview of other wolf lineages in the region, there have been many names out. So today what is accepted is the gray wolf, the Canis lupus lupus, nominate subspecies that is found in most of Eurasia. And then we have this Himalayan wolf in the high altitudes, where currently taxonomy has not, has not made a classification yet, but it's pending. Recognized subspecies of the gray wolf are the Indian wolf, Canis lupus palipes, which is found in the Indian lowlands. So that's a very different habitat and ecosystem than where the Himalayan wolf is found in India. It's dry, arid, and the wolves are very slender and, and small and have short fur. Um, the gray wolf Canis lupus arabs here is also a recognized subspecies, also very desert adapted. In the past, there was a lot of talk about a Mongolian wolf that is found in the desert areas of Mongolia. We don't have any genetic evidence that this wolf actually deserves to be an own wolf subspecies. That's why it's put in brackets here on this map because that's an old term. Also the tundra wolf Canis lupus albus is currently not recognized anymore by the IUCN um, red list and I couldn't find any genetic evidence for this wolf. Um, so the social life of Himalayan wolves, it's very similar to other wolves. They're very social. They have, I mean, the evolution of social skills comes with a higher intelligence, the ability to read another's uh, emotional state. We find that Himalayan wolf packs seem to be smaller than the average gray wolf pack. So I usually observed wolf packs that had five animals. That was two adults usually, and three pups that emerged out of their denning cave. It might be that the mother gave um, birth to more pups, but we usually saw three of them emerging. So the pack size Peep, some scientists say it's related to prey size, that basically the larger the prey species, the larger the pack will get, and this makes sense. In North America, you see um, large prey like bison, they get hunted by larger packs. So this might be a factor influencing the prey size at the pack size in the Himalayan wolves. But to date, very little is known about that. So these are just the first glimpses that we have so far. I already mentioned they have a complex social behavior. I was um, lucky to observe how parents took care of their pups at the den, and it was really amazing. And then there was a wonderful study done by Henley et al. 2017, who showed that the howling acoustics of the Himalayan wolf is different from the gray wolf. And this study actually compared Holarctic gray wolf howls to Himalayan wolf howls and also the 
um, the African wolves, that's a new um, wolf species in North Africa, and they also included Indian wolf howls. And the study showed that the Himalayan wolf howls are the most distinct from the gray wolf. And that is just another clue that they have followed a different evolutionary path. And when I say different howls, it basically such studies look at fundamental frequencies, things that you then analyze with specialized software. So when I st um, started my studies, I basically started with this tree that was first um, proposed by Sharma et al. 2004. He did a study based on museum specimens. So he used pelts and skulls in Indian museums and also from other museums in the region. And he provided the first evidence that these wolves might be different. He also tried to estimate the evolutionary time when these wolves split. And he um, proposed that it's more than 800,000 years before present. So I was intrigued by this study, but I realized that everything is done based on zoo animals and museum specimens. And I wanted to know what's going on with the wolves out there, with the actual wolves living on the plateau right now and in the Himalayas. So I started out with this very basic fundamental questions, asking who is this wolf and why is this different? And this is a very interesting question when you consider that everywhere around in Eurasia, we have gray wolves. So why in these high altitudes should there be a different wolf? That was a question that me and my supervisors, we discussed it a lot. I mean, wolves disperse very far. They can roam up to 1,000 kilometers and they mate or hybridize with anything that looks like a wolf. So why should there be a different wolf? And then I wanted to solve very fundamental ecological things like how does this wolf live? Because my mission was to collect the baseline data to inform conservation. So I had my goal and I assembled a nice team of um, Nepalese people. It was usually a very small team. The person to the far right is Norris Kusi. He has been my long-term research collaborator. And then we have um, a cook, a person that always took care of the mules and local guides. And very important was our group or herd of mules and horses who carried our gear and we had a lot of gear because we went on multiple month long expeditions. We had to bring everything, like we had to bring all our rice, all our lentils, there was not a lot of fresh food, we had to bring all the batteries for the camera. So there was a lot of logistics involved. And we, so we went on these expeditions and we camped out in different landscapes where we thought wolves might be found. We did a lot of walking and just kind of like a pack of wolves, we moved from one place to the next, searched if there's wolves in the area, collected samples, and then moved on. And in this way, we could cover a lot of um, ground. What I, a lot of my research is based on wolf sample collects, collection. So I'm a professional wolf scat collector is what I call myself. Um, no, these um, scats give a lot of information. So it's usually a hooray moment when we walk every day for almost all of the day. And some days there is no wolf scats at all, sometimes for entire weeks. And then when we find wolf scats, we know, okay, we're in a territory of a wolf pack and we kind of start homing in on their den site. So when I find a wolf scat, I take measurements, I smell it because wolf scats have a very characteristic smell. And then I take samples and I usually take samples for dietary analysis. So what have they eaten? And also for genetic analysis. The genetic anal analysis samples, they usually work like a swab that you would use for swabbing your saliva for some of these genetic anal analysis that are very trendy right now for human ancestry. It's basically the same thing, but in a scat, you have less genetic information. You have less DNA. It's what we call a non-invasive sample. 
it doesn't affect the animal if I take this sample. Much better genetic samples would be blood or tissue, but that is invasive and it affects the animals. And whenever I have the choice, I prefer non-invasive sampling because I like to do my research and the animals can go about their life. So these samples, scat samples, they tell us a lot. It starts with this beautiful wolf taking a poop. I find it and then our mules carry the samples for many months at a time over mountain pass after mountain pass until finally I bring the samples to the genetics lab where we analyze them with um, newly developed methods that I developed together with my genetics collaborator from the RZSS Wild Genes Lab in Scotland. We do the analysis in the country, so in Nepal and China, and then you get information out of these scat samples, you get genetic sequences, and with these I can then build evolutionary trees. I also counted um, prey in the landscape because I wanted to know what did the wolves have available for eating. So I knew from the diet, from the scats, what they had eaten, but I wanted to know what did they have available. So in Huma, in one of my study areas, one of the very beautiful um, herbivores that we find there is the Kiang. It's a wild donkey and they come in these beautiful herds and um, are very picturesque. And then there's also the blue sheep, which is a very important prey species for the Himalayan wolves and also for the snow leopards. Blue sheep are very common um, across the entire high altitudes of Central Asia, and they're like a staple food. But also smaller mammals are very important, so marmots. There's in the Himalayas of Nepal, we find the Himalayan marmot and then different species of pika, which are very cute. We also conducted social surveys with local people, local communities, because we wanted to understand how they perceive their coexistence with wolves. So we asked them questions about how they perceive wolves, how they perceive snow leopards, what do they expect from conservation? What kind of help would they need? Um, so it was a lot of questions that we ask all these um, people that we could find. So at the top, you see me talking to a local teacher in a local school. And at the bottom, it's Norris talking with the religious leader of the area, the local Lama of the monastery. And the density of humans in these landscapes is not that high. So we had to take advantage of anybody that we could encounter and ask them a lot of questions. But also we took note of any other sign that we could find. So here you see me measuring um, a dead wolf that is actually hanging in a little monastery, a little religious shrine. The people killed it and then hung it there for some religious purposes. What you see on the top right, this wolf skull, this dead wolf head and the paws, is actually sold to China for um, good luck in card games. So some Chinese people think that if they keep four paws and a skull in the house, they have better luck in card games. So where are my study sites? They were across the Himalayas of Nepal. I started out with Humla in the far north west of Nepal. This is pretty high. Um, I usually work in meters, but I also put it in feet so you get um, a feeling of how high it's up there. And it's this rolling trans-Himalayan landscape in Humla. Dolpa is um, characterized by very steep mountains. It just goes up and down, up and down. It's very good snow leopard habitat if you have more cliffs. And Dolpa is in Shea Fox and Do National Park. It's a government managed national park in Nepal. And then my third study site is Kanchenjunga Conservation Area in the far northeastern Nepalese Himalayas. And Kanchenjunga is generally a bit lower. It's more in the center, um, in the central Himalayas. And Kanchenjunga is interesting because it's a community um, managed conservation area. So the community themselves are responsible for the management. And also interesting in Kanchenjunga, wolves have only returned 
since the last five years or so. So before wolves were completely eradicated and now they are slowly coming back. I also did some research in China in the Sanjian Guan National Nature Reserve on the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, so-called. Um, I had two study sites there, Dijing and Angse, and this is also this kind of rolling high altitude um, plateau region, very beautiful landscape, similar prey community, and but this is on the Chinese side now and not in Nepal, and it was more convenient for research. There were much more, there was much more infrastructure, more roads, um, which made it easier, but um, probably less romantic than in Nepal. So I had this goal to collect ecological data, phylogenetic data, and data on human-wolf relations to all put together and inform conservation action. Um, you might ask, why is this wolf relevant? Well, I think you, I guess many of you are aware that predators are really important to maintain biodiversity and keep ecosystems healthy. I think Ripple and his team, they have done amazing research in Yellowstone and beyond, showing how predators just keep our ecosystems complex and, and healthy and in this balance. And I think this is really where the future is also going. This is a very important argument also in the light of climate change. Predators can keep these natural places also more resilient. And then the Himalayan wolf is actually a top predator in a globally significant wilderness region. So these high altitudes of Asia are very scarcely populated and they hold the water resources for the very densely populated Southeast Asian region. So while high up there, there's very few people in Southeast Asia, there is a lot of people and they all need clean water. And it's actually all stored in these high altitudes where that's where all the rivers originate. And that's also why the, the high altitudes there are called the third pole. And the research around the Himalayan wolf is, is also really relevant because this wolf has been overlooked by conservation, but we find that it's really frequently killed on the ground because there's no awareness at all. To date, we don't know about its population size at all. We also don't know about the trend of the population. So there's a lot that we need to learn and we need to learn that fast. At the same time, the taxonomy remains unresolved. The genetic evidence is accumulating that they really do merit taxonomic recognition, but taxonomy usually takes a bit of time, and this is actually not helping their conservation. So here, a little glimpse into a landscape up there before we now dive into the Himalayan wolf diet. So I, what I did was I counted the prey in the landscape through systematic methods. We call this, what I used was the distance sampling, sampling method where I could compare how much wild prey they had available versus how much livestock, for example, they had available. And this I could compare across the different study areas. What they had available, I compared to what they had actually eaten. So back to all these scats that we collected and the mules carried down, I then washed all these scats and put them out on a little grid. And then with a microscope, um, you can actually identify what hair um, in that scat belongs to which prey species. So for this, while being on the expeditions, I collected a reference collection from all the prey species that I encountered in the habitat and took it back home. And so then on the microscope, it was really interesting to see if they ate a lot of goats or a lot of blue sheep, this wild animal. So that was extremely insightful and this is looking a bit intimidating, but I will walk you through. The results were astonishing. So if you look at the pie chart to the to the left side where it says relative prey biomass eaten. This shows you what have the wolves eaten, what was in their scats in Humla. And there's a lot of green, so they ate a lot of kiang. But if you go, 
move to the pie chart on the right and you look at relative prey abundance in the landscape, the Kiang were not as abundant relative to how much they were eaten. So through this comparison with what they have eaten and what was available, I could get a feeling of what do the wolves actually select or avoid. And that's what the Jacobs index to the right shows. And actually what we found was a very consistent pattern. The wolves consistently selected for wild prey species such as blue sheep, kiang, and this smaller ungulate, the Tibetan gazelle. They consistently avoided um, the domestics, that is yaks and cows, horse and mules and goats. And this pattern just repeated itself through all my study areas. So this was Dolpa, same pattern, more or less, Kanchenchunga again. And in some of these study areas, you will not have the Kiang or not have this other species. But you can see here, there's a lot of yellow. There were basically only yaks available in the landscape. But again, in Angse, there was always a selection for the wild prey um, and the same in Dijing. So, this was very revealing for conservation because there was a consistent trend across five study areas that these wolves do select wild prey over domestic species. But there was also a very shocking trend that there was so much more livestock available compared to wild prey. And this, um, this is only the summer season. So the livestock is brought up into these high altitude pasture lands, which are the Himalayan wolves habitat in the summer season. So there's no livestock in the winter, we believe, but we haven't been there. So what I'm telling you about the diet only applies to the summer diet. But that is when the wolves have their pups, when they need a lot of food. And for the ratios in Humla, there was about three and a half times more livestock compared to wild prey. But for Dolpa, it was a shocking 41.7 times more livestock available compared to wild prey. And this is in biomass. So imagine how much more often a wolf encounters a livestock to eat compared to a wild prey. Um, there was also a consistent selection for this animal called the species Tibetan gazelle. That's the picture to the lower right. This is a smaller and um, gracious ungulate that is found across the high altitudes, but it usually occurs at low um, densities. So, but it was wherever it was found, it was over proportionally eaten by the wolves. And this is actually a similar trend as we find in wolves in Europe. Gray wolves in Europe, they, they like um, the roe deer, which is also a comparably small ungulate. And maybe because they like this Tibetan gazelle, maybe this also explains why the pack sizes are comparably small. But then we also found that small mammals um, are very important for these wolves up there. These are the Himalayan marmot, but also woolly hare and rodents and pikas are very important food resources. So we can learn a lot for conservation from these findings. And it's basically, we need to ensure intact wild prey populations. We need to make sure the wolf have the choice to eat wild prey and not only are confronted with the domestics. For this, we need to manage livestock numbers and we need to create safe havens for wild prey. And of course, as done for most conservation, uh, predator conservation, we need to um, make sure that livestock is well protected. And this brings us to the next part, to the phylogenetics of the Himalayan wolf. So this is all the genetic samples that I took of all these scats. What did we learn? Basically, in a nutshell, the Himalayan wolf is distinct from the gray wolf based on four genetic regions from the mitochondrial DNA and from the nuclear DNA. So we know from wolves by just looking at them, it's very hard to differentiate them. And I think it's the same for Himalayan wolves and gray wolves. There is clearly a difference, but genetics is very helpful. And then what we need also in addition, what future studies need to look at is at morphological measurements of their skulls. So it's basically measuring the bones in their skulls and the relative ratios. But the genetics shows that they are different 
and we looked at different markers. This is in the mitochondrial DNA. What you see here is the cytochrome B gene. This is a very common gene that's used to um, understand what different species, different lineages. And what is interesting, you see the, the, or the yellow um, cl cluster here, that is the whole Arctic gray wolf cluster. Here we have genetic information from wolves from North America and Europe, and also domestic dogs. And this shows very nicely that domestic dogs are in yellow and the wolves are in blue. This shows very nicely how domestic dogs are a wolf and yeah. Then in green, we have the Himalayan wolf. They form a different cluster down here that is just connected through one, basically one string here. And also very similarly is this recently discovered African wolf, also very different from the Holarctic gray wolf. We always included the African wolf in the research just to have a comparison of another um, so-called new wolf lineage and the African wolf is a little bit better researched, so it helps to compare. Um, for the D-loop, this is another gene on the mitochondrial DNA, we find the very same picture, Himalayan wolves form their own cluster here in green to the top, different from the holarctic gray wolf complex with gray wolves from all of the holarctic and again also different from in red the African wolf. And then the sex chromosomes, we also looked at both the X and the Y sex chromosomes just to have as many different genetic markers. We found interestingly that on the X chromosome, the Himalayan wolf and the African wolf, they share the haplotype. So that means there is somewhere, we don't know yet what exactly this tells us, but they share a haplotype, which is different from the gray wolf in yellow. When we look at the Y chromosome, the, the male sex chromosome, we find the African wolf has a different haplotype, the Himalayan wolf in green has a different haplotype, and the holarctic gray wolf in yellow have, has a different haplotype. And as a comparison, the golden jackal in white. So another genetic marker showing basically the same that these Himalayan wolves are different. This is a, a tree, an evolutionary tree, which I think we're more familiar with reading genetic information in this tree form. You don't need to see all the difference. That's basically just gray wolf samples from across the whole, whole Arctic, also from China, from the lowland of China, from Mongolia. Also Indian wolves are in here. They nicely group as a clade within the whole Arctic gray wolf. That tells us that Indian wolves have the right um, taxonomy, there are subspecies of the gray wolf. And then when we look at the Himalayan wolf, they form this so-called monophyletic clade. That means they form their own cluster here at the base that is distinct um, from the holarctic gray wolf. And then if you move a bit down below the Himalayan wolf, we have the African wolf, same picture here. Um, this is also, this tree lends itself, this is the same tree, but with a bit less of genetic information. But this helps to understand a little bit of a name confusion that is cur currently going on out there. So the current taxonomic recognition for this wolf's name is Canis lupus chanco. And this is a bit confusing because Canis lupus chanco has in the past literature also often been used for the gray wolves that have that are found in Mongolia. So in the past, gray wolves in Mongolia were at some point um, suggested as an own subspecies that is not supported anymore. But these um, Mongolian wolves were then called um, Canis lupus chanco. Unfortunately, now the Himalayan wolf is also called, or fortunately, it's, it's got a name recommendation, it, but that's also Canis lupus chanco. So that might cause for some confusion because you have basically the same taxonomic name used for some very different wolf lineages. For one, it's now used for the Himalayan wolf and it used to be also be used for the gray wolves of Mongolia, which are actually most likely just a gray wolf or are a gray wolf Canis lupus lupus. Just to give you an overview why um, it, I'm trying to clean up with this name confusion, they have 
been different names used besides Himalayan wolf, Tibetan wolf as common names. There have been Canis lupus, Canis lupus junco. There's also been Canis lupus laniger and then Canis lupus junco Himalayan ha haplotype. And in my early um, scientific publications, I used Canis himalayensis because it seemed to me to be the less um, least ambiguous name but it now turns out that it's taxonomically not a val valid name. Um, but back to more interesting things, how to cope with low oxygen at high altitudes. For anybody who has ever been high up, in, at high altitudes, oxygen levels really drop a lot and they make your life up there harder. You need to work much more. In these altitudes where the Himalayan wolf is found, it's basically the oxygen available to mammal species is about half the amount that you have available at sea level. So this is a very intense environmental pressure. So for somebody like me that goes to these high altitudes, my body temporarily adapts. I produce more red blood cells. But then when I come down to lower altitudes, that amazing effect rapidly goes away again. But for organisms that live all their life at high altitudes, it makes sense for evolution to um, implement basically physiological mechanisms, adaptations to cope with these high altitudes. And these are inherited traits. And it's been found that Tibetan people have such genetic adaptation to high altitudes. Then their, their very characteristic dog, the Tibetan Mastiff dog, also has this high altitude adaptation. And the Himalayan wolf has also this adaptation. And I got first aware about this when I read a study about how these Tibetan Mastiff dogs got their high altitude adaptation by hybridizing with the wolf. And at that point, I called my genetics collaborator, Helen, and I said, Helen, we need to be able to test if our wolves have these genetic high altitude adaptations. So we went to work and developed protocols that we could apply to our non-invasive SCAD samples. And it's really interesting that actually the, the, the genetic marker where the Tibetan people have a mutations, have their adaptations, is in some genes, they're the exact same genes as where the dogs and the wolves have their genetic adaptation. And this just reminds us, shows us that we are all mammals and actually have a lot of genetic material in common. So we developed the protocol, we modified the methods that um, were already published in Sun et al. 2014. And our methods are based on four functional hypoxia related SNPs. That's basically little snippets of DNA on, in the nuclear DNA and that are based on three different um, genes. And this are, these are the results. Again, you don't need to um, understand any of the details, but what springs out is the, the color regime. So what I want to show here is in the first three rows where you see Himalayan wolf in green to the left, and then when you start shifting your gaze to the right, you see it's very colorful. That tells us that there's different gene, gen, there's different alleles in these gene regions. Now, if you start shifting your gaze down, and we go into the gray wolves from different areas, it becomes this constant pattern of green, yellow, green, blue. And this tells us that gray wolves, dogs, uh, even the African wolf and the Ethiopian wolf, for most part, they share the exact same alleles on these functional genes with gray wolves, but the Himalayan wolf, in contrast, has mutations on all these genes except this um, RYR2 um, slash 1, the second region. So it's a very consistent pattern that we find, and this has actually played out across all our samples across the Tibetan plateau of China. So that was very groundbreaking when we saw these results. It seemed to explain possibly a lot. Another region um, that we looked at 
was microsat lights. Microsat lights are especially useful to identify individuals based on scats. So basically with these, I could tell, oh, this scat is from this individual and that scat is from that individual. But microsat lights can also tell us about population structure. And again, you will see here, what is important is that in green, you see the Himalayan wolf populations form a very solid cluster that is very consistently different. So genetics can tell us a lot. It looks very complex, but it's very insightful. And the most meaningful result was definitely the high altitude adaptation because possibly it is explaining us why these wolves are there. But then I wanted to understand, so I thought that maybe I know now why the wolves have diversified, why they have become an own lineage. I mean, the high altitude adaptation might be a reason. This high altitude adaptation might also be the reason why these wolves are still there as distinct from the gray wolf and have not just mixed. So then I wanted to know, but when did they evolve? So when did, was this time when the Himalayan wolf lineage became their own lineage and basically started their own evolutionary pathway that was distinct from the Holarctic gray wolf. So I used genetics, um, the genetic data again, and used the so-called molecular clock analysis. And this is an analysis that uses estimates, but it is the best estimate that we can have. You might remember in the beginning of this presentation, I told you Sharma et al, he proposed about 800,000 years before present. My estimate is about 691 to 740,000 years before present. So it's very much in the same ballpark, but what is important, the Himalayan wolf has evolved, split from the ancestors of the wolf dog clade before the modern wolves actually um, expanded and evolved. So that's it for genetics. What can all of this tell us for conservation? I think there's a lot to learn and that's actually why I did all of this research to have an argument for conservation because it's a large area where no conservation is in place at all. But basically it comes down to taxonomic classification is basis for conservation. It's really important. Currently, something that's just thought to be a gray wolf, nobody cares about. Why would the Chinese government have to do anything special about their gray wolves? Well, they are not, we could show. So the phylogenetic data is really important to inform the taxonomic classification. And the taxonomic classification is the basis for, for example, IUCN red listing for red listing in, um, for listing in any other conservation legislation and also to explain to the range countries like China and Nepal, yes, this is indeed a different wolf and there's a lot of reason why you should care about your wolves. Whereas at the moment, for example, China looks at wolves more like a pest and there is no awareness for them at all. So back to the original plan I had to collect ecological data, phylogenetic data and the human wolf relations to inform conservation. So I've spoken a lot about the ecology and um, or the dietary ecology and the genetics and now a little bit about the human wolf relations. So in the area where these wolves are found there's um, a lot of Buddhist people. There's also some possibly Muslim regions and Hindus in the region. So we spoke with all these people and it was extremely insightful. We heard a lot of stories and basically what emerges is that the wolves are less respected in culture and religion in general when we compare that to cats. So dogs, dog-like animals are just have they have a lower status compared to cats. Um, the snow leopard is more respected. It has also helped that conservation action for snow leopards has received a lot of funding and has been in place for the last 30 years. And then the Dalai Lama asks his people to not kill the snow leopards. And I think you should expand that um, message to all the predators up there. But so we could see a lot uh, through our interviews that people respect and try not to kill snow leopards 
where they have no awareness for conserving the wolves and nobody has ever told them to care about the wolves. So the wolves are killed a lot for retaliation, for livestock depredation, or to prevent um, livestock depredation. So this cave-like hole that you see in the lower right side is actually the Denning cave where people have gone while the pups were inside and the local people, they find these den sites, they light a fire at the entrance and they block the entrance with stones. And through this, they kill all the pups, the entire um, litter of the current year to prevent any livestock depredation. And of course, this is very detrimental. We've seen this a lot because it just basically eradicates the whole litter, litter of the year. And then, as mentioned before, body parts of wolves are used for good luck in card games, sometimes in religious ceremonies, and also for things like the wolf tongue is used to cure sore throats. So people in these regions have a lot of uses for different body parts, and especially the traditional Chinese medicine uses, uses a lot of animal parts, and that is actually very detrimental to a lot of wildlife species. So, but an uh, important challenge up there is like in many places around the globe is the high density of livestock. So this is a very characteristic wolf habitat. And from one day to the next, you suddenly have the herders coming up with large numbers of yaks and goats. And just where before there were wild animals grazing like the blue sheep and the Tibetan gazelle, you suddenly have a lot of yaks. And this usually happens when the wolves have um, have their young and the pups cannot move far. So the wolves are somehow bound to this location. So this is a main problem in the area. So we now can know that this livestock, we need to optimize the livestock protection. We need to probably guard them better and we'd ask the local people about if they would like to use guarding dogs because currently they have a lot of dogs around but they don't really train or use them so we see a lot of potential there and it was about half of the people liked the idea of, of using guarding dogs and were open and um, to get some workshops about that other people were not so interested in that but there's also other ways and the problem currently is that if the dogs are just not taken care of and are feral, they themselves sometimes eat livestock and then people think it was the wolves. So there's a lot to optimize livestock protection and manage the livestock numbers. So the numbers have to go down. We need to help local people to have other sources of income. Currently, they look at livestock as their bank account, and that's very understandable. If their bank account just gets gets killed, um, then they get they have to kill the wolves and other um, predators. So there is a lot that we can do for them for to help them get all the sources of income, protect their livestock better. But we also, from the dietary study, we learned that we have to make sure that there's enough wild prey around because the wolves, if they have the choice, they will go for the wild prey. And I think for this, we really need to also have some safe havens where um, no livestock goes, where the, the wild ungulates can graze and because livestock directly competes for food with the wild animals. In these high altitudes, there's very little vegetation and it comes very seasonal, so everyone wants the grass. And then we found, of course, that the conservation awareness is lacking. I was mentioning that people are very aware that the, the world cares about snow leopards, but nobody has told these people that the world also cares about wolves. And I think snow leopards are a wonderful example how conservation really makes a difference on the ground. A lot of um, funding has gone into snow leopard conservation. But now we need to expand this message to the entire predator community. So I think the times of single species conservation uh, should be over, but when conservation um, organizations come in, they should tell the people, look, you should protect the snow leopards and the wolves and the bears and the lynx and just educate them about how biodiversity as a whole is important and keeps these ecosystems healthy. 
And then finally, we learned what was very interesting by working in these three different study sites, we realized that community conservation is really what works best in these countries. Um, in the Himalayas, at least of Nepal. When people take the responsibility for conservation, that's when it really grips on the ground. The government protected national parks are not that good so far. So we really think communities should be empowered. Um, to end this, I wanna show you a little video of wolf pups in um, Dolpa in Nepal, they were just a few weeks old at this time, playing by them. And some parent was actually watching over them and here interacting with their mother. This was a very beautiful time. So as a conclusion, I think the Himalayan wolf with its unique adaptation to these high altitudes, it can be a very powerful conservation ambassador for preserving these high altitude ecosystems, which are actually some of the last intact large wilderness areas on our planet. So they're really important. With this, I thank you all so much. And if you wanna get more information, you can go to this website. There is also, if you want to see more videos, there's a nine minute video that I cut together with all the best of footage that I could collect during my expeditions. I just thank you so much and I welcome some questions. Geraldine, thank you so much. That's, this has been really a great presentation. In fact, there've been so many questions and a lot of oh. them you already covered in your presentation. <laughs> but um, for those of you who um, are just joining us now, um, uh, we are here with Geraldine uh, Warhan, who just finished her presentation on the Himalayan wolf, its taxonomy, ecology, and consequences for conservation. Um, for those that do have questions, please be sure to type your questions into the Q&A box, into your control panel. And here we go. Looks like the first one asks, um, how would you go about changing cultural beliefs i.e. good luck charms for Chinese card games? Yeah, that's a tricky one. There is actually a new exciting field con called conservation psychology. And it's really more about um, psychology and behavior change. And that's something that applies across all our environmental problems. A lot of conservation is actually working with the people and so how to change it in, in Chinese cultures to use these things as good luck in card games. I think it's really education. I think it starts with education in the schools and just making them aware that there's not that many of them left. And if they use those body parts, there's not gonna be any left soon. I think it really comes down to teaching kids in the school very early on, how it's all connected, where it's coming from. Definitely true. Um, another question is, uh, how would you, let's see, a glimpse into the wolf's sizes. Um, are all the Himalayan wolves around the same size? Um, I would say so. There have not been that, um, not a systematic study about them, but they generally are bigger, they appear bigger than a gray wolf in Europe. I think they're probably comparable to wolves high up in North America where it's just cold. So animals tend to get bigger and sturdier when the environment is colder. But they seem, what I've seen, they seem about the same size range, the adults. Excellent. Uh, how do wolves in lower altitudes compare to the Himalayan wolves as health, hunting, and aging are concerned? As, as health, hunting, and aging? Yes. Okay. Um, so at lower altitudes, so to the south, we have the Indian wolf. So there's quite a bit of information about them, and they're very adapted to those ungulates. And then in the Eastern China in the lowlands, there's basically not many wolves left, or there's, I think, almost no wolves left, but in the past there used to be gray wolves. In the north, in Mongolia, they are more desert adapted, but they're equally healthy, but they're just 
if you would put a gray wolf from the lowlands to the core Himalayan wolf habitat, I think it would fare much worse than the Himalayan wolves. It's like putting me from one day to the next day up there. I will for the first three days not be as fit and as sturdy, but then I get adjusted. A gray wolf that will be brought up there or a dog will also produce more red blood cells, but they will in evolutionary terms, they will not be as fit up there. I think what they eat, the eating is uh, the prey is, wolves are very flexible. So they will eat what they can get. And um, I think it's been shown in many places that if they have the choice for wild prey, they will prefer that um, because probably also livestock is associated with humans. But so I think they, they, they're very versatile, they're flexible and adaptive. And about the aging, we don't know anything about um, the Himalayan wolf's age. I would, how they age, how old they get. I would assume it's similar to gray wolves, uh, more or less the range. I mean, people, people up there are very healthy and get very old. I don't know if the same would apply to wolves and what causes that, but I, I don't know. Interesting. Uh, here's another one. Are there any Himalayan wolves in captivity as a species survival reservoir? Um, there are wolves in captivity in Indian zoos and in Chinese zoos. So there's, I think, two or three zoological gardens in India that keep, um, they call them Tibetan wolves. Um, I don't think there's really a species recovery plan in place. So I think these zoological gardens could use some improvement. And I think they're still more following the old model of just showcasing animals rather than contributing to the conservation. But I think this might be in, in change. There's also two zoological gardens in China. I think one is in Lhasa that we think has Tibetan wolves and one in Qinghai and Xining, but we're just not sure. There's actually some samples coming from these wolves and we're just not sure where these wolves were caught because, you know, an animal can be caught somewhere and transported to a zoo. So it's not entirely clear how large the captive population is and how diverse the gene pool would be for a breeding. I think for a breeding plan, you would first have to figure out how many are there in the wild and what will be the most urgent next steps for conservation. I'm not sure if captive breeding might be the first thing that we need to do. Got it. Um, do you see any differences in parasite activity and disease resistance? in this species compared to other wolf species? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, I don't know, I cannot tell you. That's a very large field in itself and I think it needs um, a lot of attention. I did find some scats very locally with a lot of, visually I could identify there were a lot of um, parasites on these scats and actually we send it around the world. Nobody could tell us which parasite it is. So I think there is the need for in-depth studies about that. And also with the large numbers of feral dogs, I mean, that is a big topic in wolf conservation, disease transmission from dog, dog populations to wolves and the other way around. But I don't, personally, I don't have the knowledge or I couldn't see any differences. That makes sense. Um, you mentioned the snow leopard conservation funds um, impacting the communities. Uh, in what ways did they impact the communities? So it's very straightforward. So in some places you have um, snow leopard depredation compensation schemes. So you have a village, for example, so the yak is being killed by a snow leopard. And then there's this um, compensation fund and the herder gets compensated for the lost yak. But if this yak is killed by a wolf, the herder doesn't get any money. And of course, this has been going on for quite some while. The whole community will care for the snow leopard or at least not kill them, but not care at all for the wolves. And we urge that if you have such compensation schemes in place, 
the herder should get compensated by uh, for any yak that is killed by any large predator. I think it's very straightforward. And then there has been a lot of education which people have gone done education programs. So in him in Nepal, WWF is a big conservation player that does a lot of education and they just focus um, on, they have the local people count the blue sheep, which is a very important prey species for the snow leopard and count and monitor the snow leopard population. So the local people are trained to just look for snow leopards and their prey and everything else is kind of less value and that just doesn't make sense anymore. You're right, we're just gonna have to change that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and speaking of snow leopards, is there any sort of conflict or competition between the Himalayan wolf and snow leopards? Um, no, so from my, or not that I can tell from my observation and experience on the ground, what we see is that snow leopards and wolves share the large landscape, but the, the specific habitats that they occupy are a bit different. So snow leopards, and they stay more in the cliffy, rocky areas. And the wolves are more found in these rolling grasslands and rolling valleys. So they kind of, I think their territories are more a bit adjacent and in a patchwork manner. And they do have overlapping the, the same prey to some extent, but also there's specific differences where the wolves eat more, also Tibetan gazelle, and smaller mammals like marmots and snow leopards go more for other animals. So I think they have a nice arrangement of sharing the landscape. Um, yeah. Okay, well, this is the last question. Um, what is the conservation status of some of the prey species you've mentioned the Himalayan wolf preying upon? So um, the blue sheep is least concern and the Tibetan gazelle, I'm not sure, I think it's endangered because it's at low densities. Otherwise, the prey species are generally okay. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the big ones that is in trouble is um, the, the, the shantouche, that's the animal that is almost wiped out from the Tibetan plateau because its wool was used to make shawls and that is critically endangered now and it's only found in certain areas on the Tibetan plateau but it's not really an important prey species anymore at this point because it's gotten so decimated but otherwise um, the region is large and the species do okay I think yeah, because just because of the vastness. But there is a problem with the road network in China. It's, it's constantly increasing and the, the Chinese um, Belt and Road Initiative is actually producing more roads and accessibility into these habitats. So we expect more poaching and I think most wildlife species will get under more pressure. So far, that these places have been somewhat remote and hard to get to has um, protected them. But with the infrastructure development, this is also changing. Oh, well, Geraldine, like I said before, there were so many questions and you're, you really covered so many of them in your presentation. So thank you so much. Well, um, thank you for listening. Yeah, is, there, is there anything else you want to uh, mention before we wrap things up? No, I mean, I just want to thank you all so much for listening and showing interest in the Himalayan wolves. And if there's any other questions or anything I can help with, just drop me an email and, and Maggie will ha has my contacts and I'm happy to share anything about these wolves, support you in any way. Oh, thank you so much. And I have a question. When are you going back out there? Um, next May, I hope. I want to observe some more wolf behavior. That's going to be the next um stage research phase, more wolf Excellent. behavior to learn how we can conserve them better. Oh, well, we wish you luck and we look forward to following, yes, uh, following up you. with you to see how everything turns out. So again, thank you, Geraldine, so thank much. Thank you. Uh, it's been so interesting. Wonderful. And um, for everyone else, we really appreciate you being here. Um, if you would like to learn more about the Wolf Conservation Center or our scientific webinar series or the 50 wolves who call the Wolf Center home, you can visit our website at nywolf.org. 
And again, everyone, thank you. And we hope to see you in 2020. Have a great night, everyone. Have a great night.